compassion a love that's never failing let mercy fall on me everyone needs forgiveness a kindness of a savior the hope of He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again I give my life to follow everything I believe in now I He can move the mountains My God is mighty to save He is mighty to save Forever Author of salvation He rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave the whole world sing we're singing for the glory of the risen King Jesus shine your light and let the whole world see we're singing for the glory of the risen King Savior he can the mountains my God is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave Jesus conquered the grave
speak what is true Cause I am found I am yours I am loved I'm made pure I have life I can breathe I am healed I am free May I invite you to gather around the Lord's table this morning. If you didn't get one of the little communion cups, self-serve cups at the door, go ahead and get yourself. You can go back and get one right now. This morning, I'd like for us to give some thought to our dear sister, Ruby Clark, who about a month ago now had open heart surgery. And she has yet to regain full consciousness. The left side of her heart is working, the right side is probably about 50%. Uh, Monday, the doctors told Roger that there's pretty much everything that could be done has been done, and, and they didn't have a lot, and they were pretty pessimistic. And then apparently Friday, um, they celebrated their 55th wedding anniversary in the hospital, which is not what you want to do. Uh, but uh, the doctors looking at the I guess the echocardiogram or whatever said that there'd been some improvement and they were actually seeing some healing in the heart. So um, I would like to invite all of you uh, to set aside some time Monday or all day Monday uh, as a day of prayer for Ruby and for the Clark family. Uh, praying for her healing, praying for comfort for the family, praying for God's will to be done. 
the Clark family has walked with the Lord for many years, and they, uh, they're ready to accept his will. For the believer, <coughs> it's a win-win. Whether we continue here uh, with people we know and love and things that are familiar, or whether we go home to glory to be with Jesus, we can't lose. And so the Apostle Paul says that as he was uh, writing in Philippians, he wrote the epistle to the Philippian church in prison while he was waiting to hear from, uh, waiting to appear before Caesar, uh, who was going to judge whether or not he had been preaching an illegal religion, whether Christianity was a legal religion in the Roman Empire. And so he was waiting to appeal to Caesar and to defend his cause there. And so I'll read, um, I'll read what he, he writes to the Philippian church. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether in life or by death. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I, I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and, and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you, again with joy in Christ Jesus, will overflow on account of me. And so we believe that Paul was uh, released and did have opportunity to uh, go perhaps as far as Spain preaching the gospel, uh, but uh, was again uh, imprisoned later and became a martyr for what he believed. So um, it's a win-win. I'd invite you to participate with us as we uh, remember two things. What Jesus did for us on Calvary when he died for our sins and the fact that Jesus is coming again. And all who love his appearing will be united with him, with Jesus in glory. You want to pull the wafer out of that, out of the top there. Figure how to do this. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence. Our hearts are heavy for Ruby and for the Clark family. And we pray that they will receive your grace. Uh, that you would, uh, our desire would be that Ruby comes home to Roger. But if Ruby goes home to be with you, that would be glory. And so we pray that as, they, as our church and as Roger and Ruby go through this trial, that you'd grant them grace and comfort and peace, that we may rest in your love. Father, we thank you that you came into this world, took on human flesh, and experienced life and death for us. That when you were nailed to the cross and when you rose from the dead, you destroyed the power of death. So that Paul could say, oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? And so we thank you for destroying the power of death, that we can look forward to resurrection and new life. Help us to live in the joy of walking with you every day this week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. If you would take the cup as well.
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Josh now if he'll come and read our scripture today, which is from Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17. All right, if you're not there already, um, Matthew 17. We'll be reading from verse 1 down to verse 13. As I said in the beginning, we'll be talking about the transfiguration of Jesus, where he showed his true glory to a few of his disciples. This true story happens just a few days after Jesus foretold um, his death and resurrection, and also when he told his disciples that they needed to take up their cross and follow him. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. He was, he was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise, and have no fear. And when, when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus alone. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is, is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come, and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also, so also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. Thanks be to God for his word today. Amen. There is something that each one of us longs for. We don't see it clearly but we catch a glimpse. We might hear it in a note of beautiful music performed at a live concert. We might hear it in the wind blowing through pine trees on a warm summer day. We taste a hint of it in a beautiful sunset or a quiet day in the woods sitting in your deer stand. We might smell a bit of it in a fragrant blossom growing in our garden, or roasting turkey on Thanksgiving Day spent with our family. We might get a hint of it in an athletic competition where the athlete who wins receives a token. The winning horse in the Kentucky Derby is draped with a blanket of roses across its back. An Olympic athlete receives a gold medallion. Perhaps we taste it in a bite of cold watermelon on a hot summer day or the thrill 
of bringing that big fish flopping into the bottom of our boat. But glory is not really any of these things. Glory is something more. What is glory? We long for glory when we are sick, when we experience loss, when we fail at something, when we are lonely, or simply in the dullness of a melancholy, cloudy day. We long for glory. The fatigue of the pandemic has made us long for glory all the more. This world is not as it should be. Despair haunts our souls because, well, because God seems so far away at times, farther than he is. Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes, all is emptiness. He examined the pleasures of life, all of them, wealth, family, all the things, companionship, work, and he found it all to be empty. Moses asked to see the glory of God on Mount Sinai, and God revealed his glory to him. And when he came down, his face glowed, and so he, he needed to put on his veil to cover that reflected glory. The Shekinah glory led the Jews in the desert for 40 years, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. In the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord. And the seraphim cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory, which is true. Many places we can see God's glory evidenced. But this world is broken. And because of that, we only see glimpses of the real thing, of the full picture. What is glory anyway? Is it just shiny? Is it sparkly? <laughs> what is glory? In the scripture that Josh just read, we're told in a parallel account that that their garments shone white as light, brighter than any launderer could clean them. In the book of Revelation, glory is described more with color, like a rainbow. What is glory anyway? I like A.H. McNeil's definition that glory is a spectacle of outward beauty as a visible sign of God's moral perfection. It is a spectacle. It is something beautiful. It is this quality of God that um, we can see. We're told God is love. If you could see love, what, what would it look like? We're told God is just. If you could see justice, would it not be beautiful? And so it is the visible character of God, a spectacle of outward beauty as a visible sign of God's moral perfection. And when we see God, we will see him as he is. Jesus took three of his disciples up a mountain a couple hours on an afternoon to get a break from serving others and showed them what they longed for and what was worth living for. And for them, what would be worth dying for? One day, all who long for the appearing of Jesus will be glorified. But for now, we wait. What do we learn from this passage? First of all, glory is closer than we think. When Jesus was transfigured, the word is, is uh, metamorphosis, when he was transformed, metamorphosized, what was really on the inside, who Jesus really was, came out and became visible to the disciples. They were so close, but they didn't know it. Imagine their surprise. They had walked with Jesus. They had they had eaten meals with Jesus. They had seen him teach. They had witnessed the miracles. And then they go up in the mountain and it is revealed to them his glory. They didn't know. They could not have completely understood that they were in the presence of Almighty God until 
they saw that revealed. All the while, the disciples were in the presence of glory, but they didn't fully realize it. That glory was closer than they thought. It wasn't far away. You see, there's a couple reasons why Jesus took these disciples up the mountain that day to spend some time alone with Peter, James, and John, just those three. Jesus, first of all, wanted them to go up to the mountain because he desired their companionship. He wanted them to be with him. And this is a turning point in the ministry of Jesus from this point. Everything before this was, is called the Great Galilean Ministry, is what we've called it. It's, it's a time of public teaching and miracles and healing. And, and Jesus traveled all around Galilee, out in the open, speaking to the crowds. But this is a turning point now in the ministry of Jesus, where he withdraws from the crowd... And he focuses on two things. He focuses on spending time with his disciples, training them, teaching them. It's a special training of the 12, is what this period of time is called in the life of Jesus. But it's also a time of preparing himself to go to the cross. Luke 9.52 said Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem. With intentionality, Jesus went to the cross for you and I. So this is a turning point in the ministry of Jesus as he begins to move towards the cross. And so as he goes up into the mountain and spends time in prayer with the Father, what two men could the Father possibly have sent who would understand better what Jesus was about to face than Moses and Elijah? I mean, the Father could have sent David. He could have sent Daniel. He could have sent Solomon. He could have sent Noah. Why did he send Moses and Elijah? Well, for one thing, Moses and Elijah represent the Old Testament. They re represent the kingdom of God. Moses received the law. Elijah founded the school of the prophets. But more than that, what these men had been through personally in their lives was a lot of challenge and difficulty and trouble. And Moses was never found. He went up in a mountain and God buried him and Elijah was taken away in a fiery chariot. And Luke tells us what they were talking about was the Exodus. Jesus is leaving this world. And so these two men are sent by the Father to encourage our Lord to finish the task he came into the world to accomplish. Who could do that better than Moses and Elijah, who served God in spite of the defiance of the people that they ministered and served? But Jesus also took these two men up to the mountain because they needed to see. They needed to be prepared. He took them up because they needed to see the big picture. The disciples needed to know that God's plan was right on course. And when they went to Jerusalem and when Jesus was arrested and crucified, they needed to know that God was still in control and God was still powerful in spite of the difficulties they would soon face in Jerusalem. Jesus wanted his friends to be in on this mystery that the Father was unfolding. He wanted them to understand what was soon to happen so that their faith would persevere, so that they would not be discouraged, so that they would not give up hope, but that their faith would continue. Glory lives in us through the Holy Spirit. The apostle says, do not say, who's going to go up to heaven to bring God down? Or who's going to go to, down to the depths to bring him up from the depths? The word is nigh thee. It is the word that we preach to you. That God is closer than we think. Glory is closer than we know for us as well. Because glory lives in us through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ is within us if we have faith in him. As the glory of God was veiled by human flesh in the person of Jesus and one day will be revealed to all of us when he comes. So the glorious beauty of God is today veiled in our human flesh. But one day will be revealed when Christ returns. We see here that grace, the kindness of God, is glory stooping. The undeserved love and affection of God for us is glory stooping. Peter, he wanted to 
He wanted to have a party. He wanted to camp out and enjoy the glory of God. He wanted to build a tent for Elijah, a tent for Moses, and a tent for Jesus, a, a, a sacred place of worship. And he wanted to stay on that mountaintop. He wanted to hold on to the glory. He didn't want it to slip away. He wanted to savor the glory and keep it. But it's not now. We can't camp out and relax in glory just yet. All we get now is a glimpse. We want more, but we have to wait. Jesus had to wait. Philippians 2.6 says that our Lord Jesus did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, a thing to be hung on to, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant and being obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus was willing to come into this world and allow his glory to be concealed, hidden, veiled in his humanity, to become our savior. Jesus temporarily veiled his glory. And so Peter, uh, his suggestion was pretty much ignored. He doesn't get an answer. <laughs> but the father comes and says, listen to my son. Behold, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And they were scared. Wouldn't you be scared if you heard the voice of God? If you heard the voice of God speaking to you saying, be quiet and listen to my son, I think I'd be scared. And they fell on their faces and worshiped and they covered their eyes. At the voice of the father, they were terrified. Remember, Adam and Eve had hidden from God in the garden when he called their name. But you know what Jesus did? It's interesting. Uh, this story is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But Mark and Luke don't tell us one little detail. That Jesus reached out and he touched them. I assume all three of them. He touched Peter, James, and John. And when they lifted their eyes, when they got over their fear, their terror, and they, they looked, only Jesus was there. Moses and Elijah was gone and, and the glory had again been veiled. How many times in the gospel do we read about the touch of Jesus? Where Jesus touched a leper, where Jesus touched a blind man. And so that's glory stooping. Jesus touching, saying, let's go back down, guys. It's okay. I want to remind you of something that's very important that we get from this story, though, as well. This true story, this that actual event that happened in the life of Christ, is that Moses and Elijah were also glorified. Did you get that? That Moses and Elijah, Jesus was glorified, his glory was revealed, but Moses and Elijah were also glorified. And I'll bet, you know, when I don't think the father asked for volunteers, you know, who wants to go down and talk to my son, I'm sure everybody in heaven would have said, oh, oh, let me go. <laughs> But we see a glimpse of Moses and Elijah, and we get a little bit of a hint of what is waiting for us, that we, too, will be glorified, that our character will be revealed, that when all the failure and pain and dross and ickiness of this life is burned away, and all that is left is glory. What, what Christ has done in us and through us and how Christ has changed us and made us into the person we are becoming. That when we see Jesus, we will be glorified. That just doesn't mean sparkly and shiny. It has to do with beauty. A spectacle of beauty, of moral perfection. Isn't that worth living for? Isn't that worth longing for, to be with Christ? This is a glimpse of what our resurrection will be. The dead are not dead, but they live. Glory always, thirdly, comes through sacrificial service. Moses, Elijah, Jesus sacrificially served God. On the way down the, the, the mountain, the disciples asked this question about Elijah. They, they, they said, isn't Elijah supposed to come? And, and Jesus doesn't entirely answer their question, but he gives them enough. Jesus said, Elijah has already come. 
The reason they were asking this question is because in Malachi chapter 4, 5, and 6, we are told that Elijah will come before the day of the Lord, before Messiah comes, before the end of time, Elijah will come back. And so having just saw Elijah, they thought, is the world about to end? Is this it? Is it all going to be over? And Jesus doesn't entirely answer all their curiosity. He just says Elijah has already come. And, and so there's a double fulfillment to this prophecy. And Elijah, they figure out, is John the Baptist. Well, John the Baptist came before Jesus, and he prepared people for the coming of Christ. He pointed people to Jesus. And then when his task in this world was done, he was executed. His head was cut off as a party favor for, uh, by Herod Antipas, for uh, son of Herod the Great, who slaughtered the innocents in Bethlehem. He was executed for his service to God. John the Baptist received a crown of glory through sacrificial service. But also Peter, James, and John would witness with their blood. And this was to prepare them for glory to come. This event that Peter, James, and John saw strengthened their resolve for many years after the resurrection as they continued with difficulty to serve Christ and with opposition. Peter recalled this event. If you've got your Bibles open, uh, you can keep a finger in, in Matthew and turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, where many years later, Peter recalls this event in verse 16. Peter says, we did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him, the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven and when we were with him in the sacred mountain. So many years later, Peter remembers this event and it's something that every time he got discouraged, every time he faced opposition, every time he experienced failure and disappointment, he reminded himself, I'm not crazy. I was on that mountain. I saw Jesus with Elijah and Moses. It's real. This isn't a story. The gospel and the Bible isn't a story that we made up. We were eyewitnesses. We saw the glory of Jesus, and we will see it again. That's what kept him going. That's what keeps us going, is longing for glory. James was the first pot, the, the, of these three men that went up with, with um, Jesus to the mountain. James was the first apostle to die at the hands of yet another Herod, Herod Agrippa I, grandson of Herod the, uh, the Great, had James executed just to make the Jews happy. Peter, according to the church tradition, was crucified upside down. John, we know, was exiled on the island of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. He was the, lived the longest of any of the apostles, but he too was a martyr. The, these three men shared a crown of glory through sacrificial service. And glory is worth living for. Glory is worth dying for. So what should we do? I'd like to read you one more scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you've got your Bible and you'd like to turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 through 18. Death is victory, life is serving. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though we outwardly are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So church, let's stop looking for glory in the wrong places. Church, let's wait patiently for the appearing of our Lord. And let's work now to receive that crown of glory. Would you stand with me for closing prayer and worship?
The worship team's going to come back and lead us in a couple more songs. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, just the opportunity to be in your house today. Lord, we're thankful for those glimpses of glory that we see all around us. The power, your power as creator and savior. Lord, give us courage and faith, courageous faith, to wait, to live our lives with glory, glory on the inside, that other people can know it's there even though they can't see it. Father, we again pray for Ruby, ask that you'd be glorified in her physical body and the Clark family. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in worship. And day. 
crucified to set me free. Now I live to bring in church.